welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, guest Nigel Smart and I revisit the topic of MPC, that is multi-party computation, and catch up on the progress that has been made in the field in the last few years. He describes some of the components that go into an MPC system, such as garbled circuits, secret sharing, and FHE. We discuss some of the use cases for MPC, both on the system level, like DKGs and threshold signature schemes, as well as real-world use cases already deployed in the wild. Throughout the interview, we also discuss the combination of MPC and ZK and how each can offer useful benefits to the other. Now, before we kick off, I just want to once again highlight the upcoming ZK Hack Istanbul event happening next month, November 10th through 12th, just before DevConnect. This is our second IRL hackathon, and we invite you to come along and build with us. Meet the teams working on ZK, learn new skills, find collaborators and friends, and imagine new ways to use ZK in real-world applications. We hope to see you there. The link to apply and more info can be found at zkistanbul.com. I've added the link in the show notes. Now, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsors. Ever feel like developing zero-knowledge proofs is a daunting task? The team at Risk Zero is here to remind you that it doesn't have to be that way. Their out-of-the-box tooling allows developers to access the magic of ZK proofs from any chain without needing to learn custom languages or build custom ZK circuits. Bonsai, Risk Zero's most anticipated product, allows developers to prove huge programs off-chain, roll them into one succinct proof, and verify anywhere with low amounts of gas. Visit r0.link forward slash ZK podcast to learn more and sign up for the Bonsai waitlist today. So thanks again, Risk Zero. Join Gnosis DAO and be part of a revolution in decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem the driving force behind acclaimed products such as Gnosis Safe, CowSwap, and the Zodiac DAO tooling suite. Gnosis Chain, a resilient and credibly neutral EVM chain boasting over 160k validators, a diverse range of clients, and a trust-minimized bridging to the Ethereum mainnet through ZK Lite client bridges and Hashi. Gnosis have introduced the world's first decentralized payment network, Gnosis Pay, and are building a web of trust-based income protocol, Circles UBI. They're on a mission to simplify self-custody with an easy-to-use wallet that offers features like passkey or email onboarding, account recovery options, transaction batching, and gas abstraction. Do you want to help drive the mission to create a blockchain platform that empowers developers, businesses, and users alike? Gnosis are searching for a VP of technology who will provide technical leadership, foster innovation, and ensure the success of their technology. Check out the full job description and apply on the ZK Jobs Board. That's jobsboard.zeronowledge.fm. So thanks again, Gnosis Dow. And now here's our episode. Today, I'm here with Nigel Smart, an expert cryptographer and someone who has been on the show before. We're going to be talking once again about the topic of MPC. Welcome to the show, Nigel. Hi, it's great to be back. It's been a long time. Been a long time. So I did go back and listen to our previous episode before this one. It was episode 90, recorded in August 2019. Something people may not know is behind the scenes since then, you've actually been sending me amazing guest ideas. So we've been in touch. Um, I know you sent me some great FHE guests, uh, as well as some like cryptographers doing work I hadn't, I didn't know about. But yeah, what we were thinking about with this episode was like, we had you on those years ago. And at the time, we did sort of a check-in on MPC. That's multi-party computation. But we haven't as a, like, I don't think I've done any like proper episodes on MPC since then, I think. I don't think. I don't know. We've done a bunch on trusted setups, but not the general topic of MPC. And so I just feel like it's a really good time to check back in with you, to get a lay of the land, to... Yeah, and to also hear what you've been up to. Cool. Okay, where do you want to start? Let's start on you. So last time we spoke, I think you were 100% at Leuven. Yeah. And you told me all about that that school, actually. I think I, I've been keeping my eye out of like work coming out of there ever since. But yeah, maybe you can share a little bit about what you're doing now and yeah, how it, how you've evolved in the last four years on the career side. Okay, so, um, so in those days, I was 100% at Leuven and... Um, 
I had founded this company called Unbound Security, which was doing MPC for general, um, like threshold signatures, threshold, all sorts of other stuff. And, um, that got sold to Coinbase in 2020 sometime. Oh, cool. Yeah, 2020. 2021. Yeah. End of the year 2020, beginning of the year 2021. So since then, I've been kind of doing other things. I've been helping a number of other startups in the space, just not only the, the blockchain space, but the wider cryptography space. And I think we're going to kind of like touch on some of those things as, as, as we go through the episode. So some of those companies that you're interfacing with, would you say they're primarily in the MPC side of things or are they kind of across the board, cryptography, cryptology? I think they're across the board. There's a lot of stuff. Um, so cryptography is used everywhere. Yeah. So it's used whether it's in your bank or whether it's um, in your mobile phone, it's used on the blockchain. You know, everyone, cryptographers have this kind of like saying crypto means cryptography, not cryptocurrency. Yeah. So when, <laughs> So we really very, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's everywhere. So there's a kind of like, there's lots of um, stuff going on, but obviously a lot of the kind of really exciting stuff is happening in the crypto equals cryptocurrency mm-hmm. space. So uh, yeah, whether that's zero knowledge, whether that's threshold stuff, whether that's FHE, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on there. But yeah, I think what we wanted to do today was revisit MPC. Yeah. And we're going to be spending some time looking at, you know, what's out there, you know, how it's changed, what state is MPC at? Mm -hmm. Let's start off with like a definition. We've talked about it usually in the context of trusted setups, but I actually, I want us to like go back to basics, define what MPC is, multi-party computation generally. Okay. So it's really, so the the definition has actually always been the same. Yeah. In this, in that MPC means what it says on the tin, multi-party computation, right? So you have multiple parties come together and they can compute an arbitrary function of their private data, only revealing the outcome of the computation. Now, what it turns out is that the word MPC then, so that's actually what it does. That's kind of like a functional description at a very, very high level. And the confusion arises is because people use MPC also for the technology, which allows you to do that functional thing. Ah, and so, and so that's one problem. And then people focus on very, very specific applications. Yes. Okay. And actually, it's really, and, and I think over the last few years, I've kind of tried to kind of let separate those things out in, in people's minds when I'm talking to people. So what we have is we have the functional description is it allows you to compute an arbitrary function, a private input without revealing mm-hmm. the private values. Okay. So we can compute an election. Today is the classic example is that everyone understands. Do an auction, okay, between many, many people can bid, sealed bid auction. You can work out who won the auction without having a trusted person. Okay. Now let's kind of then, so that's that's the application. Now let's look at the technologies. So there's three kind of key technologies that allow you to build an MPC application. Okay. So one is called garbled circuits, which is kind of, very old and very, uh, kind of interesting mm-hmm. application. One is called secret sharing, where we share a secret amongst a group of people and we proceed. And the other technology which allows you to do MPC is fully homomorphic encryption. Huh. Right. So it's kind of like there's kind of there's yeah. the technologies. And then if we look at applications where sometimes people use the word MPC is distributed key generation, DKGs, is an MPC application because we have a group of people, the distributed people, each put in some randomness and out pops a key at the end. And we don't learn what the randomness was to go into the distributed key generation. So we don't know what the overall key is. So distributed key generation is an application of MPC. So it's a use case. It's like a use, use case. Okay. It's Got a it. use case. So the other one is threshold signatures. So if you want to do, if you want a threshold wallet, like you would have from Coinbase or from other threshold wallets that are out there, Fireblocks, Defense, all sorts, mm-hmm. um, that is you have a secret shared secret and you use that to compute a signature where the secret doesn't come back together and the secret is kind of kept secret mm-hmm. because secret is a matter can be kept secret. So that is another application of MPC, and we've already mentioned like auctions, et cetera. Yeah. Now, the kind of other thing which is kind of confusing is that it's about privacy. 
And so people confuse it with zero knowledge. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now here is, so this comes back to the, to the you know, like your zero knowledge podcast is the name mm-hmm. of the podcast. Mm-hmm. So here's the kind of interesting thing. Zero knowledge doesn't really give you privacy mm-hmm. because the prover has to know the secret. And the prover proves that he knows something. Mm. So he knows the secret. Someone knows something. Someone knows the thing. Okay. Right. So, for example, so suppose you're doing a auction on the blockchain. And what you have is you have everybody encrypts their things to the auctioneer. The auctioneer opens the encryptions, works out who had won the auction, and then posts a zero knowledge proof that the auction was done correctly. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not a private auction. What's well, private to one person's? It's private, yeah. yeah. <laughs> one person learns stuff. And that actually is yeah. a real problem because if you have that single person, the, the trusted auctioneer, mm-hmm. that actually changes the game theory and the dynamics of the auction because the auctioneer can now front run. They can cheat. Totally. Yeah. So there's this there's, there's, so zero knowledge is kind of like a, a funny thing. One it kind of seems to say you've got privacy, but you don't have privacy for everything. Yeah. And the other thing is that actually zero knowledge when you do roll-ups and stuff like that, often you don't care about the privacy anyway, so no one really cares about the privacy. True. <laughs> the True. That's proving yeah, – there they're trying to prove the validity of what's under the hood. Now, what I want to – because later on in this episode, I want to talk about the sort of combination of these yeah. technologies because I know that there's been work in that direction. But – I want to talk about another way that ZK and MPC kind of come together, which is where MPC is used for the trusted yep. setup. I kind of want to talk about this because it's just, I'm just realizing that the way that the trusted setup is formed, it's like the goal of it is to create like something random and indecipherable. But in that context, I've always heard the following. In MPC, if one single participant is acting honestly, then the, you know, the output will be correct. But I don't think that actually is the case if you're like trying to combine a lot of data from different parties and it should be accurate, right? Like this is, this is the distinction I want to draw on. Like, okay, so there's various um, things you can say. Is the output correct? Is the output private? Is, is it subject to an adversarial problem? Okay, so there's kind of different things. Okay, so let's look at the trusted setup. Mm-hmm. So if we did a trusted, there's only two of us here, alas. Okay. <laughs> so if we just tried to do a trusted setup between us, we can execute a protocol whereby if my private input is definitely private, mm-hmm. the output of the computation will be um I, we can guarantee is kind of random. So the, the private, random, not you wouldn't be able to compute it from just your yeah. yeah. But the problem is, is that you could um, stop the protocol running because we've only got two of us. If you decided not to play ball or decided to do something wrong, we would then abort the protocol and we would fail. So there's kind of so the thing is, is that you have it's e- easier when you have more people, right? So if we imagine we've got four people doing things. Yeah. You can build a protocol which tolerates one person being bad. If two people are bad, then they learn all the secrets. Okay. But if one person is bad, they don't learn anything. And also if one person is bad, it doesn't stop the pro- the good people proceeding. So you have this security, uh, what's called robustness, that we can that the bad guy can't stop the good guys going on. But you also have a number of, of bad guys that can get together to learn the secrets. You have a threshold for the bad guys and a threshold for the bad guys to break privacy, Mm -hmm. also a threshold for the bad guys to stop the computation proceeding correctly. And so you have have this balance that you have to uh, bear in mind. I want to talk a bit about that second part, the privacy part, because when that statement, like as long as one participant acts correctly, the outcome is usable for a ZKP, Often what you're trying to make sure is that there is uh, like an output that is never going to be able to be discovered or or tracked down, right? The toxic waste. Like you don't want that to be recognizable. You don't want one person to be able to recreate it. 
and use it maliciously. And so that argument of like, if one person acts correctly, then the MPC, the output of the MPC, the output of the trusted setup is usable. This is only to do with the privacy part, isn't it? Well, it's kind of different. It's kind of, so, so, okay. so if, if you think of um, how, how oh, this is kind of interesting because what you have is the uh, trusted setup is kind of slightly uh, strange in that what you want is you want everyone to be able to put some random stuff in. Yes. You want a bad guy not to be able to stop the computation. Mm-hmm. And you want the output to be random as long as one person is random. Exactly, yeah. Okay, as, so long that, as, so as long as one person puts something random, it will make the whole output the random. The outcome is random. Okay, yeah. so, the, so, the, um, so the, in some sense, the, the, the MPC in this is the first two. It's the creating the program that you run in MPC does the, 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 the second one, so for the last one. So, for example, if I take... Some values. Uh, this is a stupid example. This is not a proper trusted setup, right? So I take if if we come up with if I come up with a value x, you come up with a value y. If you come up with the value, if you choose the value y to be zero or one because you're horrible, you're the bad person. Okay, malicious I'm, actor. <laughs> yeah, you're the malicious actor. I pick if I pick a number between naught and two to the hundred twenty-eight. That's really random. So if you just add naught or one to it, it doesn't make it less random. My, the fact that we, when we just add our two numbers together, the fact that I pick something really random yes. means that the sum is truly random. So yeah. that's basically the program. I'm actually executing Z equals X plus Y. Mm-hmm. Now, if you could wait till if the protocol is designed badly, you could wait until you see my X and then you output minus x, and you can force the output yeah. to be x plus minus x equals zero, which would be wrong. So yeah. what we have to do is we have, this is why it's called a ceremony, we have to go in a specific order such that your input can't depend on my input. Usually the way you do that well, depends on the ceremony, but actually the way you normally do that is actually you would actually impose, do a zero knowledge proof that you know your input which would then prove that your input was not dependent on my input. And then, yeah, so we would actually use zero knowledge proofs in the MPC protocol to build the CRS for a zero knowledge proof. <laughs> or you do kind of these, like the the sort of OG ones where it's orchestrated with people in different geographic locations where they could not possibly be sharing that information. Yeah, but even there, you would still have zero knowledge proofs to make sure that they aren't actually just duplicating results and stuff and they actually know their inputs. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so that, I mean, this is how I think I and a lot of folks in in the audience will have really come face to face with an MPC. But this is, like, I'm also realizing that that is such a unique use case. The fact that all you want the output to be is this random number and you want it to be perfectly random Mm -hmm. so that, like, no one could guess it. That is you know, one way to use MPC. But MPC, multi-party computation, obviously the use cases are so much more broad than just that. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, and this is what I want to talk about in today's episode because I don't feel we focused in on on how it's being used today. Yeah. So I think the, the next, well, not the best, the probably the biggest application of MPC by a long yeah. way is threshold wallets. So okay. where if you want if you want to sign something on a blockchain, you basically split your key into different components. These key goes to different people, or you actually have a distributed key generation, which is a bit like a MPC ceremony for zero knowledge. And you then have uh, an, a, this, one of these MPC wallets, which allows you to digitally sign stuff on a blockchain. And, you know, and you've got so Coinbase have a MPC wallet, which comes out of the company that um, I founded co-founded and then there's um you know five blocks of staff there's a company called defense in france dfns which has that there's um there's cup some in um other countries that you know you, you there's lots and lots of mpc wallets out there and they're all based on what's called threshold signatures mm-hmm. so what you see is that um mpc is also the same thing in people's minds as what's called threshold cryptography. So threshold cryptography is a very old thing, goes back almost as long as MPC. 
And that's now like really, really big. So we're recording this in the first week of October. And in the last week of September, there was, uh, this is 2023 for those who are catching up, listening to podcasts years in the past, right? <laughs> so the, um, so last week there was the first of these NIST workshops on threshold cryptography because NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology for the US government is going to put a call out for um, contributions and technologies to do threshold cryptography, how you do threshold ECDSA, how you do threshold EDDSA, how you do threshold RSA, how you do threshold this, threshold that, threshold the other. They're also interested in zero knowledge proofs. You know, the whole gamut of Mm -hmm. crypto stuff was last week. And um, so there's kind of like, there's a really big impetus now to try and to standardize this and, and push forward. I want to ask you about that because in our episode back in 2019, you did mention that you're waiting for NIST to do something like yeah. set. Is it this that you were this waiting is for? So this is what we're waiting for. So this is <laughs> well, four years <laughs> later. <laughs> so, so NIST. But it's I, it's not even the it's not the conclusion. This is the call to start it. It's the call to start it. So everybody's okay. now on the starting block. So it's a bit oh. like the Olympics. You know, Paris Olympics are next year. They were given the Olympics, I don't know, four or five years ago. It takes a lot of preparation. And then eventually the guns will fire and the 100 meters will start. <laughs> so we are at the, are people currently bidding to host the Olympics or are they in that's the a, Olympics? That's an <laughs> okay, so what, what people are, going to, uh, are doing is they're going to be, um, they're going to be on the starting blocks. Okay. Um, maybe it's more like a marathon. 100 meters is probably the wrong <laughs> <laughs> it's a marathon. Tri- a marathon. Triathlon? Is it a triathlon? It could be, maybe. Yeah. Is there like ha- is there the hash functions need to be or like yeah? Is there any like other types of cryptography? Well, the hash functions have already been done. You see, okay. so we've already had hash functions. So hash That's functions done. have been done. Um, we'll, we'll come back to what's been done in a minute. Actually, cool. So we have. Uh, so there's going to be a process. Actually, probably it's worth to actually go back. Actually, what, what has been done? And yeah, yeah. And explain what's what's going on. Okay, so what has okay, been done? Okay, let's do that. Okay, so what has been done is in the early 2000s, well, late 1990s, there was something called the Advanced Encryption Standard. Okay, so this was the AES algorithm, which you use all the time everywhere. We encrypt stuff with AES everywhere on our phones, on our browsers, everything. So this was actually created in Leuven, which is where I'm sitting now. So that's just kind of in Leuven two researchers came up with the AS algorithm and then the US government standardized this by one of these processes that they're currently defining. So this was the AS process. Then they wanted to do hash functions. So um, the SHA-1 hash function is considered rubbish. So they wanted a new hash function. So they called it SHA-3 because SHA-2 was also kind of considered a bit dodgy. So SHA-3, and so they had a SHA-3 process and that finished maybe about 10 years ago, I forget the right date. Now, what finished also this year was the post-quantum process. So if you're using a uh, blockchain or if you're using your zero-knowledge proofs based on Starks, no, not based on Starks, based on Snarks. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I've got to get this right. If you're based on Snarks, um, your cryptography is based on pairings. Pairings, exactly. Based on elliptic curves. If you're using ECDSA to do your signing or EDDSA to your signing, you're using elliptic curves. Now, if someone comes up with a quantum computer, you're toast Mm -hmm. because all of those things are broken, okay? So your zero-knowledge proofs go out the window, your curve signatures go out the window. So what the post-quantum competition was doing, the post-quantum process, was coming up with what should be the signature algorithm once the quantum computer comes along. So this has now been essentially decided okay mm. so that's that's been finished and so the next thing this NIST are doing is a kind of a process it's not a competition it's a process to solicit ideas and cryptographic primitives for more complex cryptographic primitives and by more complex they basically mean threshold stuff okay look they're looking at old stuff like threshold pre-quantum stuff like threshold ecdsa but they're also looking at thresholding the post-quantum stuff. So, for example, the, the other signature schemes or FHE and other stuff, plus plus the ancillary tech that goes around that. One of those mm-hmm. pieces of ancillary tech that goes around that is zero-knowledge proofs. 
you're talking about this process to sort of get threshold cryptography something, but like what are you are they looking for a number of people to suggest methods to do yes. it and one is um, chosen? Yeah, well not one is chosen. Okay, so this is very so in the past they've run a competition which was people would submit suggestions. For, for example, for AS, there was loads of suggestions. And then one was chosen as the winner. For this, this is just so complex. Yeah. They're not even thinking there's going to be a winner. They're basically saying people s submit um, ideas, protocols, example stuff, and they will look at it and say, this is a good thing. This one we don't think is so good. But they will create, a, like, it's almost like they're, I think they kind of wanted to create almost like an encyclopedia of complex cryptographic stuff. Hmm. Do they want to try to break it too at the same time? Well, I think that's, well. Like, it seems weird to just be like, this looks nice. Yes, you're <laughs> get to be included instead of it being like battle tested or something. Well, it won't be battle tested. So, but there'll be like, but, but crypto these days is not so much broken. It's much more, you have proofs of security. You know, you, yeah, you have like a why, you know, you have this kind of mathematical reasoning why this thing is secure. Or, mm. or in this domain, everything becomes so complex that um, it's actually that in this specific use case, you would use this technology. And if you change the number of parties or if you change your assumption on the network mm. or if you change your requirements, then you would use this thing over here. So there's like, I think someone last week, they just they said here's all the things that NIST have said are important. We're just going to highlight all the options which for which they thought they could come up with a um, business case why someone would care about those options. You multiply all those different options together, and you have three thousand different options. Damn. Before you've even got to the point of, and that was just like considering. Okay, we're going to do like threshold signatures if we do threshold signatures there's three thousand different options for how you would want to do threshold signatures so clearly there's not no. what going to be one winner there's going to be a smorgasbord of different approaches you could have and best practices on best maybe. practices too yeah yeah what's the duration of this competition or this uh well, it's not a competition process. it's a process okay so <laughs> <And> it's, <gonna laughs> it's, about, it's gonna take about four you know three or four years would be my expectation but you know it, it could it. go the as process was about four years the sha3 process was about the same length of time so it'd be kind of similar where these things will be public people could comment on them people could try to break them People could try to make them more secure, more fast, or different, just analyze them in different ways, see what works, what doesn't work, what's more applicable, what isn't more applicable. So that's kind of a, yeah. So you had sort of mentioned DKG and like the connection between DKG and um, MPC. I sort of want to break it down again. I know you said it really briefly at the beginning of the episode, but I want to actually understand how, like which falls into under which umbrella or is the DKG used to allow for an MPC? Yeah, um, it depends. <laughs> so, for example, so if you take the zero knowledge application of where I want the, the ceremony to set things up, you can think of that as a distributed key generation where I throw the key away afterwards. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I kind of I create a key. I create G to the X say where someone is not meant to know X, and I throw it away. Okay. So that's a DKG where you just throw away the secret key at the output at the end. So that's an example of, of an MPC protocol that I'm going to use in a zero knowledge protocol. All right. It is. So DKG is MPC. It's so not that, that it's used. That G, yeah. The DKG is in some sense an application that I'm running on top of MPC. Oh, it's running on top of MPC. Oh, yeah, this is the part where I'm confused about. <laughs> so here we go. We have MPC is this application layer. is the definition of what, what we mean to do. It's I can compute something where everyone puts something in and then I get an output, right? That's that, yeah. right. So at the top of that, I have an application, which is DKG, which is everyone puts some random shit in. I produce something and then throw the shit away. And I've got the, the CRS at the end, the zero knowledge. Okay. And then that, so that's kind of, in some sense, running on top of this idea of MPC. Interesting. Underneath that, you have um, the, the technologies that make MPC, but let's get on to that later, right? So we have this layer, which is MPC allows you to compute something. The thing I'm trying to compute in a DKG is the key generation. I'm doing it in a distributed manner. Therefore, I'm using MPC. Cool. 
So the DK, the KG bit is the application. The DKG is because I'm running the application on top of MPC in some sense. Got it. Okay. The threshold signatures, you also just mentioned that one. Threshold signatures, it's funny because like the example you used was wallets. The yeah. example I've always known is like the the proposal to use threshold. I wonder if this is the same thing. Threshold encryption. I hope it's the same thing. <laughs> for no, it's not. Oh god, <laughs> really? No, but encryption is different. Okay, we'll, we'll come to encryption in a minute. Okay, but okay. the wallet. Oh, true, true. Signatures encryption. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. The thing that I was thinking about was this is being proposed for like uh, proof of stake validation, where to prevent MEV, to prevent people front running or being able to like place orders before they see an order coming through in the mempool. There's this proposal for threshold decryption, encryption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, and it sounds a little bit similar, though, where it's like creating a private space shared by many parties. Exactly. But you, this is not MPC. No, it is. It is. Right, because. But okay. it's not threshold signatures. It's not threshold signatures. Okay. okay. Oh, right, so let's go. Okay, okay. So we think about, so let's think of threshold signatures, then we'll do threshold encryption. Got it. Okay. So in threshold signatures, it's a signature where I've got many people hold the private key and together they're going to come together to sign the document. Okay. Okay. They, so they hold unique private keys or parts of the private key? They hold parts of the private key and they're kept apart and it enable, the MPC allows you to do the signature without bringing those parts back together. Okay. So you have to break into many parties to be able to do the signature. So this is how an MPC wallet works. Okay. I see. Ah, so it's threshold signature. I'm doing a signature in a threshold manner. So to go back to my thing, I have this MPC layer, which is my, hey, you can compute anything. Boo, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. On top of that, I'm running a signature algorithm. So okay. signature is running on top of MPC. Okay, now we can look at threshold decryption. Threshold decryption is, I've got a decryption key, but I don't. I've distributed this in a threshold manner. Mm -hmm. And... I'm running a decryption algorithm on top of MPC, which allows people to obtain the decryption of something by putting everything to, by putting their parts together without actually bringing them together by running the protocol. And then that you could use to prevent MEV because you could basically, everyone can encrypt stuff and then you yeah. they commit to it and then you decommit by running the threshold decryption and then so mm. on. Wow. Okay. Just to make it slightly more cool, how do you get the threshold secret key in the signature scheme and the threshold secret key in the decryption scheme? Well, that is exactly running the distributed key generation. Key generation, I was going to ask, yeah. Uh, okay. Unlike in the zero knowledge case, you don't throw the key away at the end because you need it to be able to do the signing or the decryption later on. When you say distributed key generation, I always picture sort of like there's a key and it's broken up into lots of keys and you get a piece of the key. But wow. I'm wrong, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the key never, ever, ever exists. So what happens? It never exists. Okay. We just ev everyone comes up with some random shit, and then from that random shit, we manage to create a key plus shares of the key that we can then use an MPC protocol later on <gasps> with the signatures. And this is why you say that, like, comparing it again to ZK, where ZK, there is a truth, you make it secret through through proof, through ZKP. Whereas here, there is, like, nothing, and then you create a secret, and yeah. then you do stuff with the secret. Yeah. And the, the secret is kind of, it never actually exists. So an MPC yeah. wallet, there is a secret behind an MPC wallet, because you can do signatures, but the, that secret never actually exists. In one place in one together. Place. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it can't be attacked. Yeah. I get it. That's cool. So the threshold decryption story is it's an MPC itself. And the way you create it is to use a DKG. Which is itself an MPC. Which is also an MPC. <laughs> Where's the ZK in that? <laughs> okay. Oh, right. okay. Oh. <laughs> but there is ZK potentially, there is right? ZK there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. So here we, so here what we go in is, so now we have, Two issues with, let me just glue the MEV example, or just arbitrary encrypting data on a blockchain, okay? So what you have is that when you run an MPC protocol, we remember what we have to do is we have to maintain privacy, but we also have to make sure that the bad guy doesn't screw us over because the bad guy can screw us over by stopping us execute the protocol. Mm -hmm. So we might be using inside the MPC protocol zero knowledge to enforce correct behavior 
And that was that example that you gave for the trusted setup where ZKP itself was in the MPC in order yeah. to guarantee or in so the that's DKG. One example yeah. you can use. Okay, so that was okay. So, so one of the other companies I'm kind of working with at the moment is Zama, which is mm -hmm. um, doing FHE on the blockchain to do so you can encrypt data and you can create encrypted smart contracts. So you can imagine this could be used for protecting against MEV. Okay, so now, so what we can do is we can encrypt data, put it on the blockchain encrypted under an FHE scheme. We can do operations on the FHE, and then we can do a threshold decryption to get the value back. Mm -hmm. But when we post stuff to the blockchain, how do we know that I've posted correct encryptions? Because all you see on the blockchain is a ciphertext. Yeah. This ciphertext could just be crap, could just be a load of garbage. Right, so how do we prove that we've encrypted the correct value? <gasps> ZK. ZK. Great. <laughs> so I, these, these huh. like this idea that you, yeah, you have many, many technologies. So we have this MPC application layer, which, allow, which is this way of thinking. We can compute any function on secret data without revealing any of the secret data people input. Okay, that's MPC. Mm -hmm. We have technologies like FHE, which allow us to do MPC calculations. You can imagine that the MEV stuff or executing a auction using fully homomorphic encryption is an application of MPC, but it's using FHE as a way to do that. And during that thing, we have to prove that the, you know, suppose I'm doing an election, right? I can vote for, I don't know, what's your favorite candidates, Trump and Biden, yeah? I'm not American. <laughs> I don't know. Thank God. Yeah, well, I don't know. I can't. Who's who, you're Canadian? Yeah, I can't remember who's in Canada. Yeah, so there we Trudeau go. and someone else. Trudeau and someone else. Okay, so we're going to vote for Trudeau and whoever it is that we don't know. There's actually usually like five though. It's like a, anyway. Right, right. There's Trudeau and Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Eve. Right. Okay. We got we got five. <laughs> and then when we do an encryption, we're encrypting someone we voted for, but someone could screw over the election by voting for someone com who's not on the ballot. Ah. So I have to prove, but, but how do we to know? prove that the person who voted voted correctly for one of them? Yeah. 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 So you, they know you have a valid vote, or especially if it could be like, a, like one of these weird elections where you vote for A or B and something else. And yeah. then you've got like this exclusions thing. So there might be some complex logic behind. So you would then do a zero knowledge proof to prove that what you've encrypted is actually well formed and correct. That's cool. And so I mean now we're getting into some crossover territory yeah. here which I'm very excited for. I do want to come back to it. But before we actually do that, I want to move I want to go into what's actually happening under the hood. I think we now have a sense for what the input is to the output, who can participate, what sort of other types of cryptography you might need to create something. But actually in MPC you had mentioned garbled circuits, secret sharing, and FHE. Yeah. Can we go through those a little bit? Like, what yeah. is actually MPC? Like, what's magic. happening? They're all magic. Okay. Okay, they're all magic. They're all magic. <laughs> and it's kind of really, and actually, the thing is, they're kind of they're interesting that you can see they're separate. But it turns out when, when you get to really complex protocols, they actually all interact as well. So it gets really, okay. so yeah. So there's there's meta interactions later on. But let's not worry Crazy. about that, okay? Let's just do simple stuff, okay? Good. Okay. Garbled so, circuits. Garbled circuits. Are, are they just like injecting randomness into uh -huh, okay. existing data? No. no. Okay. A right. garbled circuit is kind of really weird. It's a really simple idea. So you take a binary circuit. So everyone does a binary circuit in electronics, okay? Now what I'm going to do is every wire on the circuit is going to have a zero or one on it, okay? So instead of putting a zero or one, I choose a completely random string for the one and a completely random string for the zero for every single wire in the circuit. So every one on a wire, so if I have two wires, so I suppose I have a gate, I have an AND gate, I have two inputs to the AND gate and one output to the AND gate. The ones, got, there's three wires in that circuit, there's going to be three different completely random values corresponding to one and three different completely random values corresponding to zero. So that's the gar that's called the garbling the wires. And now what I have to do is garble the gate. And the garbled gate is basically a lookup table, which basically uses the wires as keys to an encryption scheme 
And the lookup table has four entries in it, one corresponding to each possible entry of the AND game. Mm. And so I basically have this huge bunch of random values, which are keys on the wires, and a bunch of random um, encrypted tables. And now if I give you the random label corresponding to the one going into the first input of the AND gate and a one on the first, second input of the AND gate, they're random keys. You don't know whether that corresponds to a zero or one, but True. you use that to evaluate the gate by do, using the lookup table, which will give you the random value corresponding to zero or one as output. And that allows you to evaluate the circuit. But do I see the lookup table? You see the like, lookup could... table, but the lookup table is just a bunch of encryptions. Okay, you don't actually see the lookup table. You, you don't see like what is one to one. You don't see what's one to one. What you basically see is you see four encryptions, and you and you when you evaluate the circuit, you only see two keys, hmm. and those two keys only allow you to decrypt one of those encryptions. And so wow. you, to try to decrypt all four, only one works, and so that's the output. And you still don't know what the output is. It's still just a random piece of shit. And then, yeah, yeah. And that's 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 what a garbled circuit is. And it's really complicated, but it's actually really fast. Oh, the other cool. modern computers. So they're really, really. So originally these were introduced in the eighties, and everyone thought this was just theory nonsense. And then, like oh. I know, we started doing this in like mid two thousands. People started implementing this, and it got faster and faster. And now, really, really, really super fast. Interesting. Is this this garbled circuit part? Is that like, is that a part of MPC? Is yeah. that the first part? But then you have to do other things the afterwards. Basic technology. So what happens in a garbled circuit protocol? It's usually a two-party protocol. I create the function by doing all the garbling. Mm -hmm. I send the encrypted circuit with over to you, and now I also send over to you the these keys corresponding to my inputs. Okay. Now you need to get the keys corresponding to your inputs. So what you do is you then execute a little protocol with me so you get the keys corresponding to your inputs. You can now evaluate the circuit. Like I said, you just take these keys. The Lookup table. Go through the table. Then you get the output. And then your output, you just have to map back to the actual output where I've got I already, I know what that is anyway. So I know okay. I can tell you, oh, your random string corresponds to zero or your random string corresponds to one. Hmm. So it's a little protocol, but the main guts is this garbled circuit. And it was a two-party It's system. mostly a two-party protocol. There are generalizations, but mostly speaking, it's a two-party protocol. So how do you take that then and turn it into the multi-party? Now that requires secret sharing. <laughs> Perfect. That was our next point. <laughs> that's, incredibly, that's an incredibly good question. Right. So secret sharing is something that allows multiple parties. And so what we have with secret sharing is that we take a secret and we split it up. Okay. So there might be three parties. There might be four parties. In some sense, secret sharing is essentially what is behind uh, uh, MPC wallets. So we can get this kind of very similar idea. So you have a threshold if you have a certain number of parties and if a certain number of them are honest, then all works fine. Otherwise, there's a problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the thing is with secret sharing is it's it's linear. It's like a lovely mathematical process which allows us to add stuff easily. So we can we can execute additions really quickly. The only problem is, is when we want to do a multiply. Okay. A multiplication now requires us to do interaction, and that's when we need to send messages to each other. And can secret sharing do that? And can secret sharing can do that because it's magic. So you have this magic little oh. protocol which allows you to execute a protocol which allows you to do the multiplications very, very efficiently. Cool. So the problem with secret sharing is that I have to communicate every time I do a multiplication. Ah, it's which interactive. Which you think about when I talked about my AND gate, every time I execute an AND gate, an AND is like a multiplication. AND is, you know, is multiplication mod two, yeah? So every, if I have to communicate every time I do an AND uh, multiplication, that's a problem. But in garbled circuit land, I don't have to communicate. So what mm -hmm. these protocols which allow you to do some, they allow you to do the secret sharing to create a garbled circuit, which allows you then to do the interaction without actually having so many messages sent backwards and forwards. I see. So you have this trade-off between 
amount of data sent versus the number of interactions you have to do. I just said interactive, but then I realized as I said that maybe that's not the what you're saying. When you're saying messages going back for you're not it's not interactive in the way we've known it, is it? Yeah, it's really interactive. So it's like it is interactive. So the thing okay. is is that if I use garbled circuits, I just go blah blah blah, blah, blah at you and then you know what to do. So it's non-interactive. No, it's interactive. I, I tell you once. But once. So once. One time interactive. One time. Okay. Secret sharing is multi-time interactive. Yeah. So we've covered garbled circuits, secret sharing. We've talked a little bit about how they each have their own kind of properties. And by combining them, you get, I guess, whichever properties you want. Actually, which properties you want in this case. Like, I guess you don't want a lot of interaction, right? You want less yeah. interaction. You want less back and forth. Yes. Um. So that's the property that the garbled circuit gives you, but garbled circuits would only allow for two yeah. participants. Secret sharing offers the multi. Yeah, exactly. And also sometimes you actually, the secret sharing is good enough for multiple parties because it depends on what you're trying to do. Okay. So then the other technology yeah. is FHE. And actually we, right before you go into that, garbled circuits and secret sharing, like secret sharing, I think is just the multi, but is garbled circuits any sort of computation? Yeah, actually, you've, you've basically got encryptions. That little table is an is 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 a table of encryptions. So you but can can you compute over a garbled circuit? Yeah, you basically okay. evaluate the garbled circuit by evaluating this table by taking the inputs, decrypting, getting a value, and then repeating. Okay, is that limited, or can you do everything? You can do it for every. You could everything. Okay. You can do whatever you want. Whether it's efficient okay. or not is another question. But you can theoretically do everything. Got it. Because now my question is, why FHE? Okay. So, yeah. So, FHE, so the point is with FHE is you can think of FHE as an MPC protocol because different people can encrypt stuff. And then you have, they encrypt it to one person. That person does all of the calculation. And then you just need to do the decryption at the end to get the result. So if you have many parties, N parties wanting input in an MPC protocol, Imagine we're doing an election. If we did an election with pure MPC in a re, you know really complex election, not like a simple first past the post, but a really complex election, we'd actually have to have every voter engaging in the MPC protocol. Okay, there's ways around that, but generally speaking, that would be the what, the traditional way of doing it. With FHE, everybody can encrypt because it's a public key encryption scheme. And then we only need a few number of servers doing the computation. So mm. there's very small amount of communication. And then you have a heavy piece of heavy lift of, of computation. And then at the end, to get the result out, you do an MPC, which is like a threshold decryption. Okay. And then the so threshold encryption is using secret sharing. <laughs> oh, my God. So the, oh, wait. So the FHG, so the FHG is you have this FHE computation, which is doing the computation, but then to actually get the output out, you use a threshold secret sharing based decryption operation. And so you're actually combining all of these protocols you combine together. I want to I wanna go into this. So when you first kind of defined this, you had to mention that under the hood, there's garbled circuits, secret sharing, FHE, but here it almost sounds like a single, wait. A single technology can, doesn't work. You need all of them. You do need all, so, but but from what you said, it almost sounded like FHE could exist on its own in there. It can. Without and garbled circuits, without secret share. Yeah, but so can this, so, so, okay, right, so let's go through them again. Okay. Garbled circuits can live on their own if it's just a two-party thing. Okay. Okay. You can have a two-party protocols just with garbled circuits. Yes. You can have secret sharing schemes just on their own, and they can do stuff, and you can have FHE on its own, but that would be, you encrypt something to me, I apply the computation, send the result back to you, you decrypt. So it's almost like it's a two-party thing still. Okay. It's a very special use case. It's like you're outsourcing data yeah. or getting the result back, okay? Now, what I'm going to now do is put them all together. <laughs> so so MPC, I mean, FHE in MPC just means you can do that kind of thing with multiple parties, I guess. Oh, okay, so the point is you can do it with, as you put FHE can compute the MPC computation, and then at the end you use a threshold decryption which uses secret sharing to get the result out. Hmm. However, you can put all three together because 
Suppose you wanted a garbled circuit application because it has less backwards and forwards, but you wanted multiple parties. So what you would build that on top of a secret sharing scheme application, okay, which allows you to do the garbling efficiently with very few numbers of rounds. But then to start the secret sharing application, you might start with a special protocol called Speed that I helped develop about 10 years ago, which yes. uses FHE, the initial process. Yeah. To build the secret to build the secret sharing MPC, which then allows you to do the garb. Mm. So that you could have an MPC application which uses all of them. Interesting. I remember so I remember in our last episode, I think we did talk about that quite a lot and that combination of FHE and MPC, like yeah. in that exact yeah. case. But I still want to understand if like, would you say that all MPC protocols have FHE in them? No. Or is it really optional it's optional and it's also all of them are optional garbled circuits are optional yeah. linear secret sharing is optional fhg is optional so this helps me understand also then like mpc is almost like the umbrella term for the action of multi-party computation but it can be done there's ways. so many like what multi means could be two or more yeah right and that will that will determine what kind of underlying crypto cryptographic yeah. techniques you're using yeah I for some reason yeah this this connection between MPC and FHE what I still am left questioning is almost like why do you need FHE like if you just think of MPC garbled circuit secret sharing it can do any sort of computation uh -huh. maybe not that efficiently uh -huh. is what you sort of mentioned but like yeah why do you even need it I, I okay. still don't understand what it adds or what right. it changes let's, let's let's go back right so remember for yeah. secret sharing every time I have to do a multiplication I have to communicate so my amount, the number of times I have to talk to you corresponds to what's called the depth of the multiplications, how deep the circuit is. Okay. Right. With garbled circuits, I don't have to, it doesn't depend on the depth, but it depends on the total size of the circuit. So I can send you one piece of moolah, but it's a yeah. lot of moolah for and you. It'll take to a while to it'll decipher. take a while for you to get there. Got okay. It. With FHE... The amount of communication only depends on the size of the input, not the size of the function. Okay. So, for example, suppose uh. we're so if we're computing a very wide function, um, like an auction, say, yeah. Actually, an auction is a pretty sh yeah, shallow circuit. It's just like you know, which one's the biggest, right? So, but it says it could be a lot of input. So mm -hmm. it might not make sense, maybe, to use FHE in that application. But if I had a very deep thing, suppose I was encrypting data to you and you were applying a deep neural network to it. Yeah. It's going to be much more efficient in the long run because I, I'm only giving you the inputs encrypted and then you can evaluate the function without any communication whatsoever. Mm. And in the real world, we're limited on how much data we can send. We might think we're not. But there is a limit to the speed because there's apparently there's a speed of light maximum speed limit that you can't exceed. And there's and the pipes are, are oh yeah, who knew, yeah? And there's the pipes that are of a certain size where they're on the other hand, when it comes to processing power, there seems no limit on processing power. Moore's law stop working and we can still increase the amount of processing power, yes. Hmm. Processing power seems to be unlimited of, in effect. Whereas bandwidth and and, and, and and ping times actually do have physical limits. So that's why FHE kind of makes sense in application. For some. Yeah. Does FHE and garbled circuits replace each other then, usually? No, so you can not work. Well, not, garbled circuits are very, yeah, the, in, in terms of uh, deployed applications, there's less garbled circuit deployed applications, I, I would say. It's kind of okay, so like, but I'm just wondering if they're interchangeable, like depending on the mm -hmm. use case. No, well, they cut, yeah, in some sense, but no, but yes and no. Okay. I'm not. sure, I'm sure to implement it's way more complicated, but I just mean like architecturally, you have these three blo boxes. Would you? No, I think, you, I think I would, I would treat them as different architectural boxes that you can combine in different ways. Okay, yeah. you would not. They're, they're, different, be they're like, different pieces. Of, imagine they're different Lego brick. They're different sizes. They're different shapes of Lego bricks. Okay, I could take this stupid piece of Lego brick and use it as my basis of my car, but this one might be better. But I could, if I was a five-year-old kid, get away with this other one and just use a bit of imagination. Cool. You know what's so wild is so many of the use cases that have been proposed for ZK, I feel like are either are also solved by MPC or sometimes like 
actually are only solved by MPC that like ZK had been proposed as, as some way to make something private. But when you look at like, you know, say, I mean, I think you said this on the last episode, but it was like the hospital data yeah. example. That's been brought up so often in the ZK context of like, there's data in every place and we want snarks to like somehow prove that it has some characteristics and we then use that to, to, to do better statistics shared over hospitals. But in this case, it's like the computation would actually be done in a private setting yes. from all of these yeah, exactly. uh, individual sources. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's Or actually FHE2. FHE2. So basically it's MPC as the application on bringing data together to compute something. Yeah, but you yeah. would use garbled circuit secret sharing or FHE to do that depending on the function under, the under the hood. Yeah. But actually even that example, would FHE be the right one there? As I think through it, it's like you encrypt from all, you're getting encrypted data and then you want to like do some computation yeah, on the encrypted could data. Use FHE for that. That would be you would true. just straight up use FHE because could, like, yeah. can FHE though take more than two inputs? Yes. So the whole point is, is alone, oh, yeah. just FHE. Just FHE, except okay. how do you get the output at the end? Oh. So the point is, is you compute. So every all the hospitals could encrypt their data to mm -hmm. FHE. FHE does the calculation. And then to get the output out, you need someone to have the decryption key. But you don't want someone to have the decryption key. So at that uh, point, you use threshold decryption. I see. Okay. So it's like the second half of it. Like it's the, although in some ways, if you are just trying to get like a data, like da say you're just trying to find statistics, the output of the computation could be visible. Like it's okay if someone sees that, right? Yeah, but the point is you have, you have to get it out of the engine. If, if you're encrypting and computing on encrypted data, the encryption of the, say you're computing the average, you take it in, you encrypt the average, you've got an encrypted average, you want to get that out. So how do you get that out? You don't want to give someone the secret key, so you do it in a threshold. Manner. I see, I see. And because if you gave them the key, it would actually reveal everything in the encrypted space, everything. not just... Yeah the computation, not just in the FHE. Yeah, okay, exactly. I see. Okay, interesting. So it sounds like FHE and MPC are very, very closely tied. Yes. I mean, so this is my, what I said is that a kind of like maybe like in 2019, I was kind of making a bit of a distinction, but now my kind of thing is that MPC is this name of what you should yeah. doing, and then underneath you're using garbled circuits, linear secret sharing, or FHE. And FHE is the one which you have less communication. It costs you in computation, but it's less communication. Yeah, and it's funny because I think from your from your work, like MPC is the umbrella term. It's funny because like in my world, ZK is the umbrella term <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because everything is ZK, even MPC, even though I know it's not. Um, but yeah, I, I actually want to ask you a quick, this is a bit of an aside, but I don't know if you saw Justin Thaler's like 17 misconceptions about zero knowledge snarks. I don't know if you saw I this don't, don't paper. Know. Probably not. One of them, one of the misconceptions was sort of using ZK or like, I think in his particular thing, it was ZK snarks and the ZK of ZK snarks are, is in, in a lot of the cases doesn't actually exist. Yeah. So people are using snarks, yeah. but no ZK. Um, <laughs> I do wonder though, there's also been some debate about the umbrella term of zero knowledge to define advanced cryptography, at least for VC mm. purposes. I wonder what you make of that. Do you think that's bad or good? It's very lazy. <laughs> it's, it's really lazy. Um, and it, it's kind of silly really, because actually it, it, using the snarkiness, not the ZK snarkiness is is, is a really, really important thing because it has applications way outside of blockchain, right? So if, if I'm sending stuff just to normal app, web two application to Amazon, and I want to know that Amazon has done the right thing, that I've paid the money to do the right thing, they can send me proof that they've done the right thing. Yeah. So this snarky bit is, yeah, I think, I think is actually, that should be, that's, that's actually probably the most applicable bit of the whole tech. And the, the zero knowledge is like, it's like, oh, well, yeah, well, we could also do zero knowledge, yeah. Yeah. Are there any concepts from the snark part of ZK that's been used in MPC? Like, is it such different cryptography that it doesn't share anything? Or, ha yeah, has there been any overlap Not there? Not really. Okay. I, I don't, well, well, apart from MPC has been used to help snarks out, but snarks yeah. don't really help MPC out because... 
they're also they, i mean like they're still using elliptic curves they're so old-fashioned okay. yeah you know so in the okay end, that's in, what in, i was going to ask so like, oh my god that's just, just so old <laughs> <laughs> you know in terms of it's not actually old yeah. it's using old crypto and and i think the npc community is we don't want to use old crypto we want to use stuff okay. that is going to be secure when someone comes up with a quantum computer and i think that's the real the really killer application or well, so not the killer application the killer issue but mm-hmm. if you you know if anyone listening to this podcast wants to have a startup that kind of is going to conquer the world actually replace have a post quantum version of snark yeah but also aren't there more and more like post quantum parts of snarks in a weird way like there's been the i mean put, using fry yeah, there are. Yeah, there are. There are. There are bits, but actually having you know, like, so you have this kind of like, there's different performance trade-offs if using snarks versus starks. But you know, actually, if you could have the snarks and and everything that it's not just that the snarks, the classic snarks aren't post quantum. It's just that all of the components they use aren't post quantum. And if you could get their components to be post quantum, there's also loads of applications elsewhere. It was, mm-hmm. There's all sorts of. Um, so, for example, we can't do – so we want to replace ECDSA as the signing algorithm on Bitcoin or whatever, EDDSA on whatever change using EDDSA. We can't do that yet with one of the post-quantum signing algorithms because we don't know how to do the post-quantum signing algorithms in a threshold manner. So we couldn't have NPC wallets mm. with a post-quantum NPC wallets. Well, we could, but they wouldn't be very efficient. And so that's something that this you know, this NIST – threshold thing that we talked about earlier is going to be looking at is can we have post-quantum threshold signatures you know and that's like an an open question so there's lots of this little little bits Mm. of tech here and there that's used in the blockchain world which is which is old is nist also looking like are there components of zk that they're also trying to check for standardize they they do mention zk in their in their thing but they're kind of using they want to in their interest in zk specifically for the threshold application i see uh, general zk okay okay because that's a whole new kettle of fish that's like a Mm. huge amount that post quantum question like actually uh, this is a bit of an aside but like i know that there is some work towards lattice-based zero knowledge Mm -hmm. proofs would is lattice-based cryptography post quantum lattice-based cryptography is post quantum so uh, but there's some problems but there's the real the thing is with analysis, it's about stuff being small. So you have stuff that is or is not small. And the question is, is how small is small? Okay. So, <laughs> it's kind of like a really, this is, yeah. So, so, so <laughs> it's a very, very, very easy to explain the issue. So what I do is I encrypt, or I have some cryptographic blob that mm-hmm. inside contains something hidden, which is small. So now what I want to do is I want to prove that that blob is correct. So I want to prove that the small thing is actually small because that's what being correct means. The small thing is small. Okay. But I can't quite prove that it's really small. I can prove it's kind of small, but not really small. And this is what causes the problems with zero knowledge in lattices. And that's why it's really difficult uh, okay. because I can prove in zero knowledge it's kind of small, but not as small as I really need. <laughs> and so and there's, but we, but there's this sort of, we call it this, this, this is the soundless gap is between the gap between what you want to prove and the gap with, with what you can prove is there's this little little bit there that you can't quite get. And when you say small or very small, are you talking about like probabilistically? Is this probabilities? No, I just mean really small. I mean, there's, so imagine I got like imagine I got like I don't know 128 bits of stuff inside. This 128 bits of stuff is hidden. 10 bits of stuff, which is must be 10 bits of stuff. But I might be only able to prove that it's 12 bits oh, of stuff. I see. And 12 is still small. It's just not as small as 10. Okay. <laughs> and then, and then, so I kind of, uh, then I can't. So that's why the problem is, is that when I prove something, the thing I'm, I'm able to prove is slightly bigger than the thing that I'm really after. Mm. And so I have this kind of mix that I really want to fix. I want to make sure that we, in today's interview, cover a little bit of what state are we at in MPC and what companies and projects 
are you thinking about oh. in terms of like doing this kind of work? Because yeah, we really wanted to use this as a little bit of a check-in point on MPC, but also potentially, yeah. you know, giving us and the audience a bit of direction on where we can look next and maybe, you know, s other guests. Okay, but cool. let's start with the state of the tech. A lot of times when, w yeah, a lot of times when we talk about these, this cryptography, we might be like, this is what it can do, but it doesn't mean that it's been implemented, that it's been optimized. It's sort of like, theoretically, this is what it can do or will do. Where are we at with MPC? Like, does uh -huh. it live out in the world? I mean, I think, I think it does. But. Okay, so there, there are real applications okay. in the real world, okay? So if we talk a general MPC, which allows you to do the hospital application, yeah? So yeah. there are companies doing this. Um, in, in Switzerland, there's a company called Infer, which does stuff with hospitals. There's a company, um, uh, Tune Insight, also in, 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 in Switzerland does this. There's a company called Cybernetica in Estonia, which has a really big application, done this for lots. There's a few companies in Holland. Uh, I've gone, I remember, uh, at the end of the show, I'll probably remember what their name are. You so can add, we can add those in the show. You see companies doing the kind of like the, the big data type applications. And there's a whole um, alliance called the MPC Alliance, which represents all these companies. And if you go there, there's like about 50 or 60 logos of different companies there. What about, I heard, I heard that the big kind of ad marketplaces like Yahoo, Google, Google like, Meta. is there some MPC in there? So, so um, because of third party cookies being banned, ads really the ad infrastructure really relies on third-party cookies okay this is okay. like legacy tech from the 90s so to replace the legacy tech from the 90s google and meta and others are creating mpc systems to do ad tech so to get around uh third-party cookies so you might have seen some people in their chrome browsers have now got configuration for google privacy stuff to do with ads this kind of enables some sort of mpc fi protocols there a meta are doing the same and others. So that so big companies are doing this. The, the hospital examples. So that's really deployed in the real world. Okay. So that's traffic. Good. Is traffic a real thing or is that just theoretical? Oh. Using MPC for traffic. Because I've I've heard this a few times. I think well, you, you even mentioned cars. it. Well oh, there's cars, car I think you had mentioned like satellite data, like oh, where satellite, satellites yeah, are. Yeah. But I've also heard a car example. Yeah, there are car examples, but I'm not quite sure if they're commercially deployed. That's the kind of I thing. See. There's lots of lab or POC level stuff, but yeah. actual commercially deployed with real customers in the real world is, I think that you've got, there's a few with medicine and then there's, um, or big data, which like Cybernetic are probably the biggest company doing that. And then there's uh, Meta, and, Meta and Google doing stuff on, on okay. the ad infrastructure. In that ad example is that auction is that like for the ad auctions it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like auctions or it's also uh, your preferences so to making sure so you know those really annoying ads you get when you look at facebook yeah well i don't go there anymore but well, yeah. yeah apparently that's something to do with what you know they might look random but apparently there's a you know this is why i don't believe ai is going to take over the world if ai can't actually give me an ad i'm interested in it's not <laughs> going to do anything is it right i mean it's useless. I mean, this is the biggest amount of money spent on AI is to, to give me ads that I care about, and it doesn't. So clearly it doesn't work, yeah. right? But they think it does, so they kind of sell it. So they kind of got to do this in a way where the ad company doesn't learn the customer's preferences beyond the fact that they're just, they're interested in the ad, or interested in quotes in the ad. <laughs> okay. Okay, so there's a kind of, and also... Um, you don't want to influence the auction so that Meta can't front run the auction or things like that. Got it. Okay, so that's, that's MPC. If we look at MPC, MPC for privacy, if we look at MPC for threshold, there's loads of applications, loads of people, especially in the blockchain space. So um, MPC for threshold signing. I was in a company in the 1990s that had this for its CA. So when you had that, you had, you know, you had a distributed RSA signature to do the certificate authority signing in the 90s. This is not modern. This is really mm -hmm. old. Was there FHE in that in that type of MPC? No, no, no. no. Okay. no, no, no. That was like ages. Okay, so okay. Then we have so then we have companies like Coinbase, which we mentioned their MPC wallet, Fireblock, yep. something similar. There's a really cool company I advise in France called Defense, DFNS. 
um, which you might want to get them on. Um, there's Jonathan Katz works for them and Chelsea Comlo. Chelsea is the one that's come up with this Frost Protocol, which is mm-hmm, really popular with Mary. in the community. So, that would, so they're really cool, interesting. There's loads of others, and there's, I think there's about 20 in that space. Cool. They're, they're also in the MPC Alliance doing stuff, so that's kind nice. of employed and used by millions of people or and loads of you know, trillions of transactions today probably go through their, um, their networks. Um, you have the ZK in, in zero, zero cash that's deployed, you know, for the, all these ceremonies that people deploy. So we have MPC for that. And then if you kind of look at FHE, so FHE, there's a number of companies doing FHE. There's um, Envale in the US, Duality in the US, and I'm involved in a company called Zama, which we've already mentioned. And they've, they've, actually, all, they've, all, they've also been on the show. That was one of your They've been on the show. Like, like. There's no point <laughs> having them in the future because they were on like, two months ago. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Ram, so so Zama do a um you have brand on the show and, yeah, and yeah. Zama do uh like I think uh, since since they, he was on the show, um Zama has launched this um uh, encrypted version of the Ethereum. So you could do in- yeah. Ethereum smart contracts on encrypted data. And it's kind of using the kind of tech we've been talking about for mm. the last hour or so. So this is the on the FHE front. So I want to understand what are the open problems? Like what state are we at? Is it all of these libraries are so perfect, they're post-quantum, they work together perfectly, or, or is there still work to do? Well, there's loads of work to do. So, for example, let's just kind of – and actually, let's look at the interfaces because the interface is where there's really cool work to do. So I send data encrypted to somewhere, the cloud or a blockchain, and they then compute on this in an FHE. So I want to know that they've actually computed the right thing. They've, they might – they don't know what they've computed on. This is not a privacy issue. This is an issue of have they actually computed the right operations? So that's a zero. That's not that's zero. That's a ZK. That's a snark application because yeah, there true. is no secrets. It's that's actually, no zero knowledge. True, there true, is true. no zero knowledge. It's public <laughs> stuff. Just can you verify? Can you prove to me quickly that you've done the right thing? That's a really big open problem. That's that's mm. really really uh, interesting. And the reason the reason it doesn't work right now is this due to the type of cryptography underlying ZK still? Because ZK is so slow. It's because Snarks it's too slow. Like, snarks are slow. Mm. Snarks are super slow. So snarks, oh, sorry, are yeah, snarks. The snarks are really slow if you've got a really small... So what, what do we use snarks for? To prove that someone executed a smart contract correctly. Yeah. How long is a smart contract? It's not really that long. It's not mm. a big program at all, really, is it? They're really tiny. They're really, really tiny programs. And so actually snarks are uh, mostly K technology is for very, very small programs. And we want to do it on mega, mega, mega programs. Uh, you know, so, um, so if you could solve that, you could solve all sorts of other things. You could solve, um, I could outsource, you know, how do I know that Amazon has actually processed all the stuff in the cloud as I asked it to? It, it could just give me a quick thing back going, yes, you did the right thing. Bah, that'd be kind of cool. Um, so that's one application. Two, we just need stuff to go faster. Okay. We need stuff to use less bandwidth. So if you talk about the secret sharing applications or you talk about the garbled circuit stuff, I want to send less data because communication is mm. expensive. Um, I want to store store less data. How do I store less data? How do I, yeah, if, it, if I store stuff in secret shared form or, or encrypted form, I want that to be a smaller amount of data. So how do I do that? So there's loads of open questions. There's loads of things, especially on interfaces. What about on the FHE side? Because I'm still hearing that like it's kind of not fully usable, oh, not oh, fully there. Okay, so for example, uh, so with it depends what you mean by fully there. Okay, right. So, yeah, let's let's go into that though. What what isn't there for FHE? Okay, but first let's say what's there. Okay. Let me find <laughs> what is there? Uh, right, because you, okay. So if you if you think about the time it takes to do executions on a blockchain in a smart contract, that's relatively slow anyway. FHE can do that, can, can work at the speed of a blockchain. Okay. So the FHE can work at the speed of a blockchain. So that's still, that's fast, right? Mm-hmm. So we have that. Now we go, well, we want to go faster or we want to have more throughput. Now, today, there are a large number of companies um, around there. Intel is kind of one of the bigger companies. There's Ingon Yama, Optalysis, oh, yeah. uh, um, others, Neobium, actually producing hardware or in the process of producing hardware. Now we already have, can do a speed up of a hundred fold speed up with FPGAs. You can just buy an FPGA, mm. implement 
the FHE algorithm and you get a hundred fold speed up. So it's something mm-hmm. plausible now. We can go a hundred times faster with no expense whatsoever today, just having to deploy it. If we then go to ASIC and we put that in ASIC, we can go a thousand fold faster. And those are meant to come online 2024, 2025. So, for, so the math is going to go faster, but just that the fact that you've got hardware coming on board that's going to be coming mm. on board in the marketplace in 24, 25, there's startups working in that space now. There's a really, really cool company. Is there actually ASICs coming actual for it, or is ASICs, it still actual wow. ASICs being produced wow. that are going to be coming on to this? There's a really cool company called Optalysis in the UK which is going to be using optical computing because the thing that you need to do, and actually these are the same, this is the same technology that you would use to accelerate Starbucks. Okay. Because basically okay. what you need to do is you. F- MSMs. This is no, what we're talking about. MSMs. You want FFTs. FFTs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we did, we did an episode yeah. on hardware, a couple of episodes. MSMs and FFTs. MSMs are elliptic curves. They're old tech. So we don't want those. For ZK. (laughs) But but FFTs, NFTs, they're the things that are post-quantum, they work. And if you can accelerate FFTs and NFTs, you can apply it to zero knowledge and you can apply it to FHE. And what's interesting about this company, Optalysis, because it's optical, an FFT is an optical operation. So it's for free. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I don't know. It's weird. What do you mean optical? I don't know if I follow that. Optical computing is like instead of working with um, with binary signals, zero or one, you work with light. And an FFT is actually basically an operational light, which is for free. So it's power. It's powerless. It's just it, you just do it. Huh. And so so Optalysis is this kind of cool company that's got optical computers, and they're going to try to accelerate FFTs using um, optical processing which should be which would be like even better because it would be less environmental cost less power and they should be super fast but again nice. yeah so there's loads of stuff coming on this fp is coming along in the next year a6 coming along in two years optical computing coming along and each one of those things should also benefit the zero knowledge space and quantum computers will not destroy it all so quantum computers will destroy the blockchain because you're still using elliptic curves and starks but everybody else will be fine <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. Nigel, thank you so much for coming back on and sharing with us sort of the state of the art on the MPC front and also allowing me to kind of go deeper on what's underneath the hood. Um, I really appreciate that. So yeah, thanks for being on. Nice to be on. Thank you very much. Cool. I want to say thank you to the podcast team, Henrik, Rachel, and Tanya, and to our listeners. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.